One of the major benefits of monopolizing all forms of mass communication is the power to disinform the citizenry. If the news media, internet headlines, television and film, and educational instructors are all echoing the same talking point, the assumption is they can't all be wrong, so it must be true. But they can all be wrong, and more often than not, they are. And the consequences of such disinformation are pretty shocking. And in this video, we'll reveal 10 stats proving the power of disinformation. In 2016, a report showed that over one-third of millennials think George W. Bush killed more people than Joseph Stalin. Despite the death toll of Stalin ranging from 20 million to 60 million, that same poll showed that 42% of millennials were unfamiliar with Mao Zedong, the Chinese communist leader who in some estimates is responsible for the deaths of up to 70 million people. There's so much disinformation that dominate all our mass communication systems. Another poll showed 77% of Democrats with four-year degrees think sex is not determined at birth. Three out of four college-educated Democrats seem to believe that a man can be a woman simply because he said so. The poll also showed that 64% of all Democrats think sex is not determined at birth, but an even higher number, 77% of Democrats with four-year college degrees, think that. Which makes sense because the disinformation train may not be any more potent anywhere than it is in higher education. Another stat that shows the power of disinformation comes from a poll taken in 2017 that shows that most Democrats, 56%, think that Christians living in the Muslim world are actually treated better than Muslims living in the U.S while only 46% believe Christians in the Islamic world are persecuted over their faith. Which is an interesting take, because that same year the House voted unanimously 393-0 to zero that ISIL was committing genocide against Christians in the Middle East. In 2019, a report from the American Center for Law and Justice states that violence and oppression against Christians even worsening. The report states evidence shows not only the geographic spread of anti-Christian persecution, but also its increasing severity. In some regions, the level and nature of persecution is arguably coming close to meeting the international definition of genocide, the evidence shows that Christianity is by far the most widely persecuted religion. In fact, several studies, like one from Pew Research, found that Christians are actually the most oppressed religious group in the world. Another study in 2017 came to the same conclusion that Christians are the most persecuted religious group on earth. So while Congress has unanimously ruled that Muslims are committing genocide throughout the Middle East against Christians, while many studies conclude that Christians are actually the most persecuted religion across the globe, mostly because they're slaughtered in Muslim countries, Democrats think that Christians are treated better in the Middle East than Muslims here in America. But how could this be? How could Americans have such an inverted view of reality? Well, that's the power of disinformation, my friends. They believe it because they're told that. Like when ABC News analyst Matthew Dodd claimed Muslim persecution is a bigger problem than Christian persecution. Or maybe it's because of the onslaught of fake hate crime incidents sweeping the nation. Tales of stolen hijabs and Islamophobia always make the front page. Maybe it's because other Muslim activists scream from the pulpit about Christian privilege, calling for us to recognize that Islamophobia is one of the most widespread, rapidly growing and tolerated types of oppression in school and society today. Number four, disinformation is so powerful in our society that when the GOP passed the tax cuts, despite 80% of households receiving tax cuts, only 17% of people thought that they would actually get tax cuts. In fact, most actually thought their taxes were going up. Why would they think that? Well, because the media was reporting it as a doomsday scenario. But maybe it's asking too much for people to know anything about economics. How could they with so much disinformation, so much disinformation that 80 84% of Americans are unaware that global poverty has been reduced drastically over the past few decades. The cause can be attributed to globalization, free trade, property rights, the rule of law, and entrepreneurship, or from the products of capitalism in the Western world. More than 67% thought global poverty was actually on the rise during the past three decades. A CBS poll showed that 66% of Democrats believe Islam encourages violence about the same as other religions. So while tens of thousands are slaughtered in the Middle East and mass rape gangs and violence flooding European countries, the overwhelming majority of which are committed by Muslims, most Democrats think that Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, etc. encourage violence about the same as Islam. But how could that be? How could Democrats think when the Holy Book of Islam, the Quran, directs violence against unbelievers and think that it's just as violent as anything else? It might be because the rare instance of Christian violence towards Muslims is front page news for days on end, and while Muslim rape gangs in Europe on a regular basis goes largely unreported. Maybe it's because Muslim activists have gained foothold in our education system, giving them the power to approve or rewrite Islamic history and indoctrinate young people with it who are unprepared to counter that misinformation. For example, a comprehensive study by the American Textbook Council reported a profound historical representation of Islam in textbooks within junior high school and high school classrooms. The study found, quote, the deficiencies in Islam-related lessons are uniquely disturbing. History textbooks present an incomplete and confected view of Islam that misrepresents its foundations. These textbooks have the presence of disputed definitions and claims that are presented as established facts. 
Instead of making corrections or adjusting contested facts, publishers and editors defend misinformation and content evasions against the record. Islamist activists use multiculturalism and ready-made American political movements, especially those on campus, to advance and justify uncritical Islam-related content makeover in history textbooks. While some polls show 50% of young people think global warming is going to end the world, there is no doubt that the global warming propaganda machine has been incredibly effective. Movements sweep the Western world to ban plastic straws, plastic bags, and everything plastic because our ocean is riddled with our plastic. And if Americans just stopped using plastic, we could solve that problem. The disinformation is strong in these folks. A study by the World Economic Forum found that about 90% of the plastic in the ocean comes from 10 river systems, eight of which are in Asia and two in Africa. That would mean zero come from America. So all your plastic banning isn't really going to help now, is it? Other studies like from the American Chemical Society estimate the percentage of plastic covered in the ocean from these 10 river systems to be at about 95%. Researchers at a Dutch foundation called the Ocean Cleanup also found similar findings that most plastic in the ocean comes from Asian rivers. But this news is quite damaging to the American eco-religion, so while several studies confirm these findings, there have been some attempts to control the damage. When a website called IBAN Plastic covered the findings of the Ocean Cleanup Project, which identified Asia and not America as the main culprit of ocean plastic pollution, they would do what they can to obfuscate the findings. An update at the bottom of the article states, quote, a previous version of this article reported that a study showed 10 rivers accounted for up to 95% of all plastic waste in the world's oceans. It has been amended to clarify that the study focused on riverborne waste only and did not compare this with an aggregate figure for the total level of plastic in seas and oceans. So what they're trying to amend here is, no, no, we didn't say nearly all of the plastic in the ocean comes from Asia and Africa. We were just saying that most of the plastic that comes from rivers comes from these rivers. All the other plastic is still probably, probably America. So you can keep your eco-religion and keep banning plastic, you see, it'll be good. Let's say we take the updated claims at face value, which is probably not a good idea considering how much fraud is concocted through global warming propagandas. But let's just say we do, and we take that update as true. The next question becomes, where does most of the plastic in the ocean come from? According to the Hemholtz Center for Environmental Research, a wing of Germany's largest scientific organization, every year millions of tons of plastic debris ends up in the sea, a global environmental problem with unforeseeable ecological consequences. The path taken by plastic to reach the sea must be elucidated before it will be possible to reduce the volume of plastic input. To date, there was only little information available on this. It has now been followed up by an interdisciplinary research team who were able to show that plastic debris is primarily carried into the sea by large rivers. So yeah, nice try to walk back the damning findings about plastic in the oceans, saying these studies were only researching riverborne waste. However, most of the plastic in the ocean comes from rivers. The power of disinformation is so strong, how would you feel about a pair of sister ideologies called socialism and communism that would be responsible for the most deadly century in human history with a death toll of over 100 million people worldwide? What would you think of such system? Well, you should think it's pretty terrible, but with the wind of disinformation at their backs, leftists have even successfully been able to make young people so ill-informed that more than one-third of millennials have a favorable view of communism. 70% of millennials say they are likely to vote for a socialist. 21% of Americans think the U.S. is more socialist than China. They may have a favorable view of it, but still, 66% of Americans cannot accurately define socialism. Only 57% of Gen Z and 62% of millennials think China is a communist country and not a democratic country. When asked the question, in the past 60 years, global terrorism has killed more people than global communism, only 35% could correctly answer false to that question, meaning that 65% either didn't know or thought that terrorism has killed more than communism. 25% of Americans think the Nazis killed more than the communists in the Soviet Union. That's one in four Americans. One in five American millennials think society would be better off if private property were abolished. Nearly half of millennials think the government should provide a job to anyone who wants work. If you think this poll is flawed, others produce similar findings. The American Action Network found 60% of Democrats think socialism is great for America. Another Gallup poll in 2018 found 57% of Democrats view socialism favorably compared to 47% of Democrats who view capitalism favorably. But how could this be? How could so many people be so disinformed about history? Well, the most likely culprit is the radical indoctrination scheme that we call our education system. 25% of millennials and 23% of Gen Zers reported communism being presented favorably in K-12 through education, and both reported an even higher number of communism being represented favorably in college. 36% and 37% reported communism being presented favorably there. That shouldn't be a shock considering Karl Marx is the highest prescribed economist throughout college education. So in this completely distorted view that the most murderous system in human history, socialism and communism is better than the most prosperous, that being capitalism, that's certainly not the product of something on its own. It's the product of disinformation. If you've paid attention to politics the past few years, you've definitely heard 
heard about Trump's Islamophobic Muslim travel ban, but it wasn't, nor has it ever been, a Muslim ban. You might think so because the media is always repeating that line. However, it wasn't a Muslim ban, it was a temporary ban on importing immigrants from eight countries who pose high security risks of importing violent people into our country. The list of countries actually came from the Obama administration. Most Muslims globally were still allowed to come. In fact, 87% of worldwide Muslims were not within the eight countries that were temporarily banned. But that type of common sense eludes most Democrats. Still to this day, many leftists call it a Muslim ban. And they even put out articles talking about the travel ban, and they list the Muslim countries banned on the list, but deliberately exclude the other countries like Venezuela and North Korea because they aren't Muslim countries and don't fit the narrative. Number 10. Democrats are more charitable and love the poor more than Republicans. This belief is exemplified in this teacher's question to her students, where she was discussing the history of the American political parties and used these terms to describe Republicans. She used the words tolerant, generous, and charitable, among other lies to describe Democrats, and stingy, miserly, regressive, bigoted, etc. to describe Republicans. Now, I'm not going to address all those claims, but I will address the claim that Democrats are generous and Republicans stingy. They've done studies on this, you know, and when they do, they find that Republicans are far more charitable than Democrats, even when they make less, as well as giving a larger percentage of their income. The more red the county, the higher the charitable contributions than Democrat-dominated blue counties. Yes, Republicans give more to charity than Democrats. It shouldn't be hard to see. Bernie Sanders, a one percenter, gave two percent to charity. Beto O'Rourke actually defended his meager rate of charitable giving, saying that he contributes in other ways, like his work in politics, and that's why, on a reported $366,000 income, he gave just 0.3%. In the eight years before he became president, Obama gave an average of just 3.5% of his income to charity. In the decade before Joe Biden became vice president, the Bidens gave a total of 0.2% of their income to charity. John Kerry is much of the same. Al Gore, Ted Kennedy, it's all the same. Conversely, Republican John McCain gave 27% of his income to charity, and Dick Cheney, 77%. So Republicans give more to charity than Democrats. To sum it all up, disinformation is powerful, and the consequences of such disinformation, as explained in the prior examples, serve only to benefit the left. Because if you're disinformed, if you think reality is different than what it is, you'll be much more likely to get on board with the leftist agenda. And that's the power of disinformation.